Today we're looking at Shakespeare and the Puritans, which is a way of getting at the question that I always wondered as a student, which is if Shakespeare is writing during the time of the rise of the Puritans, then is there any sense that Shakespeare is aware of the Puritan message or of the Puritan, at least culture, there in the heart of England? Well, it turns out he does. In one of his earlier plays, Twelfth Night, which was written around 1601, 1602, somewhere in that range, Shakespeare includes one character named Malvolio, who is clearly actually described in the play as being something of a Puritan. Now, if you don't know the play Twelfth Night, it's one of the classic Shakespearean comedies. The play is about two twins, Viola and Sebastian, who are separated by shipwreck, obviously. <laughs> Shakespearean plots always have these wonderful twists to start the story. Well, assuming that her twin is lost, Viola decides, of course, to dress as a boy and to go into the employment of a countess, Countess Olivia. And what follows is a bit of a love triangle. Viola falls in love with the Duke, the Duke himself is in love with Olivia, and Olivia, believe it or not, falls in love with Viola, thinking that she is a man. Now, no spoilers here, the plot aside, the main thing about this play that's important for our talk now is the character of Malvolio. Malvolio is a very minor character. He's a steward in the house of Olivia. Well, believe it or not, he is actually a Puritan. Or at least he's described as a Puritan by the characters there. There is some debate on this. It does seem to be the case that Shakespeare is being a bit playful here. It might be that he is a Puritan, or it might be that he is such a stick in the mud that the characters refer to him as a Puritan, but the point still remains. Malvolio, you see, is cursed in this play to be one of the guys who thinks a great deal of himself, and yet all the characters around him do not think very highly of him. In fact, even his name, Malvolio, is uh, more or less amalgamation of the Latin words mal, which is bad, and volio, which means wanted or loved. We might today translate this as unwanted. Malvolio's name even means that he is unwanted. Well, in Act 2, Scene 3, we actually have a scene where Malvolio has sort of put his foot in his mouth, been a bit of a bozo, and the following dialogue occurs. Mary, sir, sometimes he is a kind of Puritan. Oh, if I thought that, I'd beat him like a dog. So Tony Belch, what, for being a Puritan? Thy exquisite reason, dear knight? I have no exquisite reason for it, but I have reason good enough. And the Maria follows us up. The devil a Puritan that he is, or anything constantly, but a time pleaser, an affectioned ass that cons state without book and utters it with great swords, the best persuaded of himself, so crammed as he thinks, with excellencies, that it is his grounds of faith that all that look on him love him, and on that vice in him will my revenge find notable cause to work. Now there's a lot going on here. The characters actually come up with a bit of a prank against Malvolio. They convince him that Olivia loves him, that she's hiding it, and that Malvolio needs to somehow come out and express his love for her as well. In the end, he is made fun of. But in this case, you see a lot of different things at play here. First of all, of course, the word Puritan shows up twice, but also the clear esteem of the characters for the Puritan world is pretty obvious. Sir Andrew says if he was a Puritan, he'd beat him like a dog. And the others protest only a bit and suggest that if that is the only reason, why would that be enough? And the response, more or less, is that he doesn't really have a reason, but he still wants to do it. And in the final dialogue here with Maria, you get a bit of a play on words. First of all, she calls him a devil of a Puritan, which obviously is oxymoronic. Puritans are those who wanted a holiness within the church, but here they're being described as somewhat devilish. Some of the language then is a bit complex, a bit archaic, but essentially she says that he thinks so highly of himself that he is so crammed as he thinks with excellencies that, again, notice the play, it is the ground of his worship that all that look on him love him. Now again, if you know anything about Puritans, the main beef that they had with the Anglican Church was the order of worship, the ways that things had carried on from the old world, the medieval world, into the Anglican Church. So the grounds of his worship would certainly be an echo to this idea that the Puritans wanted a pure worship. But here she's saying that the actual grounds of his worship, the reality of his character, is that he thinks everyone wants his opinion and loves him. 
He thinks he's so self-important. He thinks he's so well listened and liked by the community around them that he can say just about anything he wants because his opinion matters. Now, what does this mean? What does all this say about Puritanism? Well, it doesn't say anything about Puritans themselves. This caricature is actually something that will occur throughout history for a long, long time, all the way down to the scarlet letter and even the modern English word puritanical, which does not have any positive connotation whatsoever. You might say that here in Shakespeare, it's already on display. What this does say is a bit of what's at stake with the Puritan world. You see, because they were fighting their fight and they were arguing their case, but in many ways, in the court of popular opinion, they were losing it. You see, it's one thing to be listened to and to be respected. It's another thing to not be listened to, yet equally respected. But what the Puritans were fighting at this point is that in some cases, and increasingly so as we get into the 17th century, there are some who neither listen to the Puritans nor respect them. Rather, they mock them, come up with characters about what they are like and how they need to be beaten like dogs and these kinds of things. And so what ends up happening is the Puritans have a bit of a Pyrrhic victory on their hands, meaning if they win, they still might lose in the court of public opinion. So why does Shakespeare say this? Why did he do this? Well, probably salesman that he was. He knew that this would have gotten a laugh out of people. He knew that there were enough in the audience, if not a majority, significant majority, in the audience that would have found this quite funny. They all knew of a caricature of a Puritan as somebody who cared too deeply about his own words and his own thoughts, and so Shakespeare throws it in to get a laugh. But in the end, what Shakespeare leaves us is an artifact of a time long gone before the Puritans left for the New World.